Good morning and thanks for checking out the Burgero cactus. Well, it's actually Burgero cactus emeri is the name, or the golden spined cirrus. As you can see, it's very beautiful and golden spines. It's also known as the snake cactus, maybe because it kind of looks like a snake's head or maybe probably because rattlesnakes and stuff like to hang out by them. But anyways, they are native to California and Baja. So this plant will grow in San Diego and Baja and even on the Coronado Islands, which are a few miles, maybe a dozen miles or so off of the coast of Southern California and into Mexico. So very unique. I'm lucky a collector gave this to me. Never seen it for sale. And you can see the beautiful yellow flowers. Now, I don't know if these the pollen is going to ever work on dragon fruit. I doubt it. But that's something I'm interested in. Now, in addition, uh, I'm interested in trying to find this plant as well. And you can see that this is called the sour pataya. Now, uh, this actually helped uh, sailors a long time ago uh, prevent scurvy. So that is on my wish list. I would love to have this variety of sour pataya to try it out. But I can't complain with this beautiful Burgero cactus MRI. Now it's really stunning. It will grow. I'll show you some of the older growth now. It will grow three and a half feet tall and five feet wide in time. It's very, very, very spiny. As you can see, you don't want to mess with this thing. And it definitely likes some shade in if you if you live inland like me in other words this plant only grows three miles inland native uh, in its habitat so i live about 13 miles inland so i'm going to need to give this some afternoon shade and protect it kind of like dragon fruit that's how i'm going to treat it uh, it is hardy down to zone 9b and they say it will survive down to about 25 degrees so the new growth especially is really beautiful in my opinion and as you can see, by the way, it can be grown in pots, but I'm going to plant this in native soil. I'm going to find the perfect spot for it and plant it into the ground so it gets some afternoon shade. I really think this is a beautiful, stunning, and spiny cactus. It does like good drainage, and it grows well in sandy or loamy soil. Beautiful colors and bonus points for being a, sandy, a California native plant. Southern California, I guess you could say, and into Baja. All right, let me zoom out for you and show you that it's full glory. There you go. It's a beautiful morning here, and check out the new additions to the collection. I'm really excited to go through some of these and share them with you, and I'm even more excited that we have some supporters of our channel that are so kind they give us things like this. So, wow, I have a lot of gratitude and a lot of excitement, so let me go show you what we have. So the four of those are Peruvian apple cacti, which I find interesting because some have longer spines than others. I'm still looking for the truly spineless one. I've seen it before. And then on the left here is the Echinopsis Schick hybrids. They make really beautiful flowers. And now these, now the Selenoceres that's red just needs to be re-rooted, re but there's a Selenoceres vegans, a Selenoceres doncalarii, can't remember offhand. This one could be Selenoceres spingulosus. And then this one I'm really excited about. It kind of looked like a bunch of turtle heads. And this is Selenoceres testudo. So really stunning variety of Selenoceres. I'm excited to see a flower in the future. Now here's that red one. You can see it needed to be re-rooted. Re and over here are some Hyloceres costarosensis. So now I have that variety added to my collection. And let's go check out these now. So this is an unknown variety. It's very beautiful. If you can give me a hint in the comments, to, or a lead, I guess, would be better. Let me know. It's rather petite. Now one of these two is native to the Coronado Island or islands and into Baja. I can't remember which one. I want to say the one on the left. And this one's just really spiny, but really beautiful and colorful. And then here is a Puntia violacea. 
really like the color, the violet color. The spines are larger than I thought it would be too. So Puntia violacea. So this is a really beautiful blue colored cactus. I'm really excited about this one. And if I remember right, it had two names and he called this one a Pyloceres palmarii, I wanna say. I called it an old man cactus, but he said there's several old men cactus, so I need to know the proper name for this one. It's really beautiful. And this one is a bluish tint as well. And I have the name written down, but I cannot remember it offhand, I'm sorry. I think it had azure in the name. So you can see it's very blue up top here, and the new growth is really stunning. And then over there, these two, the one on the left is unknown, and the one on the right, he had a huge collection of a cluster, and it was probably my favorite cacti he had in the yard, and it is a Stenoceres hybrid, if I remember correctly. Good morning, this is Paul, and thanks for checking out this stunning Pyloceres leucocephalus, also known as Pyloceres palmarii, or the woolly torch cactus, or I've seen it called the old man cactus of Mexico too. Now it's actually native to not just Mexico, but Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. That's probably why it has so many different names due to the wide distribution. Now you can see I just planted it into my native soil here in Southern California, zone 9B, and I amended it with quite a bit of palm and cactus mix, which is some high quality brand I can't remember offhand. But that's gonna help this plant thrive in a full sun climate and it's hardy down to about 25 degrees so it's going to do great in our yard which rarely gets into the 30s but you can see what it's really known for is that it has this beautiful beautiful kind of hair or fur or wool i guess you want to call it uh, i think the proper name is wool and you can see that as it ages it will develop more and more in the branches and it will grow a thick wool in time. Now there are spines. Let's see if we can find some. I really like, look, love the blue color. Look at this, it's just such an amazing color of cactus. It's utterly stunning in real life. And I hope it shows how beautiful the color is on film as well and on video. It does have some spines. You can see them like over here. They're very fine can move the hair for you ah well they're there let's see if we can get one see it and so they will start out a beautiful color kind of brownish yellow but in time they'll turn gray so I really like this cacti cactus it's about three feet beautiful variety and it was a gift from a fan of our channel that had a huge one and so he had rooted this and he was kind enough to give it to me. So I'm really grateful. So I can't wait for this thing to get bigger and I just can't wait to enjoy it. It's just such a stunning variety of cactus. Okay, there it is, the Pyloceres leucocephalus. It's a beautiful morning here and thanks for checking out my Pyloceres azureus which is also known as a blue torch cactus or blue boy or woolly blue spirals. Now it's a unique columnar cactus that is native to Brazil and South America. You can see, I actually just got a cutting from my friend that he had rooted and now I placed it in native soil here in Southern California, San Diego, zone 9B. So I amended the native soil with some palm and cactus mix and this thing is just gonna take off. It's really beautiful. It will grow nine feet tall. It's hardy down to about 20 degrees and likes well-draining soil. And you can water it infrequently once it's established. So it is a drought tolerant variety of cactus. Now it does tolerate full sun in San Diego. So it is a sun loving variety and it can be grown in a pot. Although I think it's gonna outgrow it rather quickly, but I do see people grow them indoors and in pots 
you can see I'm gonna keep this thing outdoors and see what happens and let it grow in its full glory. So it's a really beautiful, attractive looking cactus. You can see the colors. Let me try to get a little bit more in the sun. There we go. And the spines are just beautiful and kind of golden in color too. Which are just amazing. See them there? It is rather spiny. And it will produce uh, one and a half inch kind of white flowers with magenta colored leaves, which are very beautiful. It's a wonderful specimen plant in my opinion. Pretty rare, hard to find, and expensive. All right, we're at Sal's house, and he's being generous enough to give us a couple cuttings of Nopal Blanco. So this variety of cactus, I believe, is native to Mexico, and it is a um, type of prickly pear cactus. You can see the prickly pear right here, Scott. And um, Sal says they don't taste very good, but what we do with this is, um, if it was a younger cutting and fresh, you actually cut and eat this plant. Um, I've eaten it before, it tastes really good, um, and they've had it with some garlic, but uh, what could you tell us about it, more about this cell? Well, like we, how do we cook it, prepare it, what's the way to do well, it? Well, when they're really young, you know. So this you one you wouldn't want to eat? No, no, okay. no, those are too old. In fact, everything here is too old. It has to be very young, you know, little small. So you want a really fresh, yeah. small piece? Yeah, it, it, what it is, it's called nopal blanco because along the thorns, there's a little bit of white around it when it's real young and what you do is you you take the thorns off you dice it a couple thorns there yeah you dice it and you you know put it in a pot with some water and uh maybe a little bit of garlic clovers and a little bit of um onion and just cook it and afterwards you could once it's cooked and you drain the the liquid off it mm -hmm. what you do is you add a little bit of uh, cilantro and a little bit of um onion i mean there's a different way of cooking uh -huh. but that's the, the freshest way of, do, of using it and then it just tastes wonderful, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. What would you describe the taste as being similar to? Well, it's kind of tangy. So, so maybe with a texture of okra, maybe? Mm -hmm. mm. Because yeah, it, it, it does have a little bit of like a slime to it, you know, when, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of slime, but yeah. not bad, not like yeah, aloe vera. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, this is Nepal Blanco, an edible variety of cactus. Um, and I'm very excited to have a cutting. To me, it just looks very different than any other uh, prickly pear. I have several varieties, and so this one you could just see is, is unique. So I'm excited to someday get to eat some of this and cook with it and enjoy it. The whole thing is just really crazy, the whole plant. I mean, look at this As thing. As it matures, you can see it, it kind of gets a callus, a beautiful kind of reddish tint. I don't know if that shows on the video, but I really, it's, it's shape and the colors are unlike any other variety I've ever seen. I mean, even the size. It looks like a prehistoric huge. plant. It is, it's like, a, it's like at a Jurassic Park. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, it's really neat. Amazing. So I'm really excited to grow this. It, it should grow in a uh, pretty easy, well-draining soil. I'm gonna just treat it like a succulent or uh, and it should do fine. Good morning, thanks for checking out a Puntia Quimillo. Now this beautiful prickly pear is native to Argentina, Bolivia, and into Paraguay. And it does grow in a nice sandy kind of well-draining soil, and it likes pH of six to about seven and a half. Now what I like about this variety is that it has these really beautiful reddish orange flowers, and they're very stunning. So you can see what it looks like. And this is what they look like now. So you can see they're spent flower buds. But lots of fruit, and it ripens into close into the winter in Southern California. And what's interesting about this variety is some of the flowers are female and others are hermaphrodite. So it is a self-fertile plant, which is a good thing. Now you do have to be careful, some of these little fruit and the plant itself does have those really spiny right there you don't really want to touch with some of these because they could irritate your skin and in addition it has very 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 large spines longest out of any of the apuntias in our collection 
In addition, I did observe that it kind of grows more slow and, and wider instead of vertically. Although I've only had this plant maybe four years now and it's just spreading and doing great. Now it will get a maximum height of 13 feet and I'll say about 13 feet wide as well. Now it's very low maintenance. We'll even tolerate neglect, I guess you could say. Uh, this plant will just, as long as it's established, it's gonna grow in Southern California as long as you don't overwater it. So I'm excited to taste this fruit when it's ripe. I did not try any last season, but this year there's a lot more on it. So I'll give it a shot here soon. But it's just not quite ripe yet. They should turn like a darker red color. You can see some of them are starting to turn red and they are getting a little bit looser. So there, pretty soon. Now I'm not sure if you can eat these when they're green like this still, but I'm gonna wait until they turn red. So there you go, Apuntia quimillo. It's a very beautiful prickly pear variety and it likes full sun in Southern California. It's really hardy. Today we're gonna discuss prickly pears or tunas. The proper name is Apuntias. Now, there are way more than 40 species they can vary a lot from being densely spined to having no spines at all, depending on the species. They easily hybridize and they're native to Mexico and the desert southwest. Now, they are beautiful this time of year because the flowers and the new pads are growing and the flowers will bloom all day. Well, look at that, look at how stunning that is. This time of year, it's just an amazing plant, in my opinion. Now, they do have really beautiful flowers here. Let's get up there and show them to you. There you go. And they can vary a lot in color. They could be yellow to more kind of orangish in color, but sometimes a really bright, brighter yellow than this. It's more of a darker yellow. This variety, uh, it's unknown. I think it's a Barbary fig but I'm not sure. I've given up trying to find out because the, again, these things hybridize and there are really so many different varieties. Now this will produce a red fruit, really, really sweet and it tastes great. Now, <clears throat> as a kid, we used to eat these a lot and I learned the hard way that on these flowers here are, I believe they're called glow kids. See the little tiny spines below the spines? Man, they irritate your skin so bad. Some people burn them off but if you get those onto your skin, you're hurting for days. We used to just, our, our fingers would itch. Oh, it's horrible. So definitely be wear the proper protection when you mess with this plant. Uh, they're really tiny bristles. Let's see, what else? Oh, we eat Nepales, which are wonderful. You can cook up these new young pads here. Scrape off the spines, cut them up, put a bit of garlic and oil. And man, it's wonderful. Several restaurants in nearby our house in our Southern California <clears throat> cook it. And you can buy it. It's wonderful. I like it a lot. I like to eat nopales. So let's go check out some of the other varieties we have in our yard. But this one, I do really like the flower. And the fruit is red. Okay, well, let me go show you some more. All right, here's another variety in our yard flower is a bit more pink and this one is a beast I think it's also a Barbary fig or a hybrid hybrid of a Barbary fig because they're very similar but these have longer thinner pads than what you saw before and you can just see this thing's monstrous it's been here a long time in our yard I'd say at least 40 years Here's a few more that we have. No Paul Blanco on the right. And then these are two new different Apuntias as well. Well, I'm not sure about that one. But I find this one, it's interesting. I've seen them around. They're very long, not very spiny at all. And look at that, it's produced a flower already. So amazing. Amazing plants. Now, if you want to know how to propagate them, I would recommend just 
a nice well draining soil in a pot. I have a, quite a bit of pumice in there and I stick it in the soil about that far and look at that it's very happy I got these four months ago all right this spiny bugger is a puntia quimillo so now you can see the variability here's a fruit that was on it didn't quite develop fell off probably because we had a lot of snail damage now you can't see some pests or snails they do like to attack this variety especially, despite the very, very large spines. So again, this is an Apuntia quimillo, and it produces a tasty red fruit. Alright, let me go show you some more about pests, and let's wrap it up. Alright, believe it or not, this is a cutting from the first plant I showed you, and I did it about seven years ago. But that yellow spotting, it's about the only thing you need to worry about. You don't really need to worry about watering them in Southern California once established. But you need to worry about this yellow spotting because it's called cochineal. And I don't see much on it this time of year, but it can get pretty bad. And here's a spot. And that's cochineal actually is used to dye food or to dye uh, clothing and for some food coloring. So let me show you what this pest is. The ants love it here, the Argentine ants, but cochineal is really, really red. So you see they use this for a dye. So very interesting. Some people actually grow this and harvest it just for that dye. So cochineal. So this is a strange pest. It's very, very red when you exterminate it like I did to show you. So again, Look it up, cochineal. And it's about the only thing that certain varieties of prickly pear are affected by. Especially this these really wide paddle cactus. But apuntias are afflicted the worst. The beautiful Ripsalis elliptica. Now this is a Brazilian native that is sadly threatened due to habitat loss. Now it grows in subtropical and tropical moist lowland forests of Brazil kind of under the trees you know and it gets a lot of shade in its native habitat it's actually an epiphytic cactus as you can see and this is the new growth it's a very beautiful green now this is something else so right here you can see it's getting a little overexposed but I wanted you to see how much sunlight this thing gets first thing in the morning and it will turn a kind of a copper bronze, especially if it gets too much sun, it's gonna turn on to like a full bronze color. And I almost killed this when I first got it. You could actually see it's a little bit rotted in there. See it? And that was because I had it under a jacaranda tree and it just was getting too much sunlight. It turned full reddish bronze, almost died. And then I put it into this pot with some epiphyllums. So I probably shouldn't keep them mixed, but hey, it's happy, I'm gonna leave it alone. Now, I recommend growing it in full shade. As you can see, it only gets this little bit first morning sunlight. It's gonna be in the shade the rest of the day. And it's doing great. So amazing growth this season, even in the winter. Now, it will have small and yellow flowers. They're very petite. And I haven't seen that yet. Now, this plant is easy to take from uh, cuttings. You can propagate it easily can just take one of these leaves, let it dry out a bit, and plant it in some well-draining soil, and don't overwater it. So really beautiful, kind of wide-leafed, unique-looking succulent. I really, really like this plant. You can see the new growth is what I think is my favorite thing about it. So I water this once a week, maybe twice in the summer, twice a week, and just really protect it from sunlight. If you grow it indoors, I'm not sure about how much sun you want to give it, but I would probably say less is better. And if it's really, really green, slowly introduce it to more sunlight until you get some of this bronze color. Because you can see this plant is really happy. So I will say it's very kind of cold sensitive. You can see some of the discoloration here as we get into the 40s. And I will say it's 
tolerated down to about 32 degrees and survived. Hello, today you are checking out Austrio Celendrio Apuntia Subulata Cristata. Um, I think I said it right. Call it Eve's Crested Needle or Eve's Crest Needle. So this plant's interesting because it will be in crested form or slightly crested form. Um, when I bought this, it was in full crest mode. You can see the new growth is crested right here. This is a, a native to uh, Peru and Ecuador, I believe. Um, hardy to 20 degrees, and it's in the prickly pear uh, cactus family. Makes a red flower, reddish orange, followed by reddish uh, fruit. I, uh, crested ones do not bear fruit or flower from what I've read. I've never seen this thing fruit or flower, but as it gets older, um, it's starting to show a non-crested variety. So this cylindrical one. Scott has a really big example of this plant. Um, so hopefully I'll toss in a bit of footage here so you can see it as well. Um, let's see, what else do I need to say about Eve's Crested Needle? Has really large spines, be careful. So look at those. Um, and the new growth is very, very interesting on the crest. Check it out. I think it's very beautiful. And it's not so spiny on the new growth, huh? And then again, over time, it will create the more cylindrical, typical non-crested variety of this plant. So these things will get, I think, 9 to 11 feet, really, really large. Um, and they're just a cool little cactus. And again, really hardy, do well in Southern California. Uh, some people, or several people, grow these in containers. Uh, that's really common, and even indoors. So I've seen some that seem a little less spiny than ours um, online. So I thought that was an interesting note, but um, I did buy this thing with a proper label and it is getting there. Can't wait till it gets much larger. Good morning, this is Paul, and thanks for checking out Ripsalis cirrus cula. Now I call this the coral cactus, or some people call it the rice cactus, and it will get some long branches from time to time. However, usually it's a profuse epiphytic cactus with short stubby branches that kind of look like rice, if you can see. Hence the name rice cactus. Now, it's native to Central and South America, into Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. And it has these beautiful light green, kind of rice-shaped joints, like I said, that are cylindrical. They're really petite. Now, it will go dormant in my climate, Zone 9B, during the winter right now. It's pretty much dormant. I don't see any new growth. And so I water it about once a week in this pot and it gets full shade. I've had it about 18 months now. I have not seen any flowers yet, but they're tiny kind of whitish flowers. And they could be even pink or purple. Again, I recommend giving it full shade in Southern California. Too much sun will burn this plant. But most people grow it indoors, so you could probably give it some a bit of filtered light. I'd be really cautious though. Like honestly, this only this gets zero sunlight directly. So during the growing season, I will water it twice a week. And I like having it in this hanging pot with some other Ripsalis and some different varieties of like string of bananas and things like that. They seem to live well together. I haven't fertilized it yet. I gave it some high quality, well-draining potting soil. You can see it's doing great. I actually give it the same mixture as I do my dragon fruit because they're both epiphytic cacti. Now here's a different variety of ripsaws, this one hanging down that gets larger. And you can see actually we have another video, Scott will put a link there for you. And this one is much longer and larger. So hopefully you can get yourself a ripsalis, some type, some variety. They're really interesting little epiphytic cacti. Good morning, this is Paul, and I know I should be wearing gloves, but check out what my buddy sent me. Now this is Acanthocerus tetragonus. Common name is Triangle Cactus. 
a fairy tale cactus, or sword pear. Now, if you look online for the fruit, you're gonna see a lot of variation about color. It does have spines on it, but I think it might be this orange enigma pataya. So we'll see in time. And here's another cutting. Look at this. It's actually, this one is four sided. So really beautiful variety. And this is grows from Florida into Texas, Mexico, and all the way down into Central America. And it's often used as actually a natural uh, fencing. So to, to create fencing, I mean, some even call it the barbed wire cactus, I think I read online. So believe it or not, look at how tall this thing can get. It can get 23 feet tall in time, and it has really, really large stems, as you can see. So what I'm curious about with this variety is how much sun it will take tolerate in our climate in Southern California, zone 9B. Now, notice these lengths of these spines can be over an inch and a quarter. So really, really uh, a plant that you need to be respectful of, in my opinion. Now, to root them, it looks like he's already put some rooting hormone on it, which is great. They look really happy. And I'm going to put them into this location here, where I call this my little winter propagation station. So I use coconut coir with all parts of it, the pith and the husk, and a grow light, and mycorrhizing fungi. So there's this rooting hormone I'm trying out, you can see it, and hopefully I can give you an update soon. I'll tell you what, in the last week I have noticed no rot, and it's doing great. So anyways, back to this plant here. It's a really, really beautiful, interesting cacti that I can't wait to see what happens. So give us a like and a subscribe, and we'll let you know what happens with our wonderful, wonderful plants here. This is Paul, and we got some more cutting, so super stoked. Shout out to Ty from Spicy Exotics. He always, always delivers excellent cuttings as advertised. So starting on the right is K1. It's a Hilo Sirius, the dragon fruit, which is a white flesh. It's kind of like a Vietnam white, but larger. A fruit can get three pounds. The one right here is a Megalanthus, which is a yellow skin cross with an unknown Selena Sirius, which are the ones over here. So once um, I realized that you can cross the pollen and, and these can be crossbred to make hi new hybrids, I got excited and thought I needed to buy some of these ones here, some these varieties of Selena Sirius. So starting on the right is uh, the Honduran Moon Torch. So I'm gonna talk about different potting soil strategies for these because they're a little bit different from dragon fruit, as you can see, but very similar. This is uh, the Princess of the Night, another Selena Sirius variety. Um, and there's not that much online about them that I could find. So I'm gonna use a little bit different soil strategy for these guys. But this one looks a lot more like dragon fruit, more like a hexagon or octagon shape. So I uh, thought that was interesting. And then this one is really spiny. And this is a Selena Sirius, I wanna say, let me pull up the paper. Um, this one is Selena Sirius uh, validus, validus. So very spiny and very cactus-like. So it seems like I'm gonna um, have to do something a little bit different with this, these guys to uh, have them in optimal com conditions to grow and sprout roots. But from what I hear, they're epiphytic, they're epiphytes, cacti, and they will do fine um, with well-drained soil. Now another one, this is Mid Midnight Lady Apple Cactus, I, I think. I have, that's the best, I, uh, closest thing I could find. We'll see once it fruits. But this is a, actually a Harissia variety, so I don't know if the um, pollen will work on dragon fruit, but hopefully someday I can find out and let everybody know. So, um, anyways, very, very unique varieties related to dragon fruit, and supposedly I can use the pollen. So anyways, to create my own hybrids. Uh, but anyways, the strategy I'm going to talk about now, briefly, is potting. So I got uh, Home Depot, these kind of cheesy, I hate to say they're kind of cheesy, sorry Home Depot, but they're kind of like cheesy painted uh, pots, but they are hanging pots, so I want to hang these up to promote root growth 
and to uh, mix the soil a little bit different here I'm gonna cut it with some extra perlite uh, well happy frog of course and then I'm gonna cut it with extra perlite and extra uh, vermiculite so I'm gonna mix a ratio um, probably an extra like maybe 10% perlite 15% and maybe three to five percent vermiculite added to this potting soil so I'm gonna mix it up in this big 20 gallon pot and I'll show you what it looks like um, once I have them hanging in my location that I choose all right there you go uh, there's the ratio I'm choosing I'm gonna say it's about 15% um, extra perlite three to five percent extra vermiculite and the rest is happy frog so I'm gonna mix this up put it into these little Home Depot pots that were only seven or eight bucks and they have a built-in hanger so I'll get these hung and I'll show you what it looks like at the end okay so here you go I have them here hung up the princess of the night is on the right and the hunter and moon torch is on the left and I have them hanging up in a trellis here for our dragon fruit so you can see here it's just gonna be temporary to get them to root and then I'll figure out a better strategy to hold these varieties of plants I've seen them growing on trees online. I was thinking I might have them growing the, uh, up through this fence with uh, some trellis support like we've shown before. Uh, but I need some time to research these guys some more. Especially this Hunter and Moon Torch because what I saw online, sorry about the lighting, is that um, it kind of grew in trees. I saw a lot of pictures of it growing up in palm trees up high and uh, hanging up kind of under a Canary Island date palm. So uh, this thing's gonna kind of get really long and crazy. So I'm gonna figure out a better strategy for it. Maybe put it up high and let it hang down. Kind of, we'll see. So I'll learn more about that. And then last but not least, here is the last of the Selena Sirius. And this one I kind of just have it, I'm leaving it alone here in its potting soil. Sorry about the lighting, let me hide that for you there. And you can see it's just got some nice rich soil and it's going to do fine here. I'm going to just kind of let it drape by itself onto this wood and then figure out what on earth I should do with this later because it's really spiny. So if you know how or have these plants and have a good strategy for us to use to trellis them, I'd like to know, but we'll get them to root at least and we'll go from there. What a beautiful flower. This is the princess of the night or Selenocerius patranthus. Now, it's native to Mexico, I believe, and the flower is stunning. So I'm going to harvest some pollen here. And I'm going to try to hand pollinate it. Now this variety is self-sterile, and I don't have a, another pollen source handy right now. But I am going to collect pollen because I have another Selena series that will bloom pretty soon. So this flower is absolutely gorgeous. What it, it's about eight inches in diameter and these front little bracts or petals, I guess you call them, are white and kind of yellowish gold. And then in the back are beautiful red petals. Wow, it's very stunning and it smells like a spicy vanilla. That's the best way I could describe it. I really think it's one of the best smelling night blooming flowers I've smelled yet. So again, this is a self-sterile plant so I just want to check that and I collected a nice amount of pollen and let's get a better look at this plant at first light tomorrow morning. Wow, the princess of the night did not stick around. You can see the flower was closed off at dawn this morning, and you can see it's much less red than it was as well. It's more, it's losing its color, it's fading. Now, if this plant sets fruit, which it shouldn't because I 
pretty much sure it's cross uh, needs a cross pollination source. It would produce a beautiful little fruit here that would be pink, and you could remove the spines easily from it by brushing them off, but it wouldn't taste very good. Now this grows four or six sided, and it's native to Mexico and throughout the Caribbean. Now, I wanted to use this as a pollen source because there's been some very interesting dragon fruit hybrids like cotton candy that use Selena Sirius as a pollen source. In addition, this is related to Selena Sirius megalanthus, which is the yellow skin dragon fruit, which many of us love, yellow pallora, columbiana, and more. And in addition, these share the similar DNA to Selena Sirius. This is yellow cross 68, and this is yellow tie. And the point, my point is I wanted you to know that all of these were hard for me to root and I needed the temperatures to be warmer consistently for them to root. So just be aware of that and do not overwater them um, if it's cold especially. So they just, it was the hardest three cuttings I had or hardest, some of the hardest ones to root in my experience. So just wanted to let you know about that and to be aware of that. So it's about 10 o'clock and this gorgeous Epiphyllum hokeri has opened up and bloomed. So I'm gonna go ahead and pollinate it with some Laverne Red dragon fruit here that I've saved. It's a couple weeks old. So here we go. So as simple as that. And we'll see what happens. Now it will produce a fruit that is edible. I've tasted it before, it tastes kind of like roses to me. So again, this stunning flower is Epiphyllum hokeri. We'll talk more about it at daylight. All right. Okay, so it's a little after 7 a.m. and you can see the hooker's orchid cactus is still in bloom. Now this is named after botanist Sir William Hooker. And it's related to dragon fruit. This plant, or Hyloceres, I should say. This plant, the flower, is about eight inches in diameter and nine inches in length. Now, if you're wondering why I used dragon fruit pollen on this plant, just remember that Edgar Valdivia created his Asunta. He got a purple flower because he cross pollinated a dragon fruit, a Hyloceres, with an epiphyllum. So I want to see if the pollen works the other way around. So anyways, this plant is native to Mexico and into Central America and Venezuela. And it's known for this really kind of long, flat, strappy foliage. Now it's kind of reddish to green. So if you're, you give it too much sun, that, that branch is, is going to be really, really red and you don't want that. In fact, these epiphyllum are very similar to Hyloceres or dragon fruit. As you can see, there are some three-sided. Now, I was told I should never grow them together in pots, so that's exactly what I'm doing. I want to see what happens. I heard that they can, like, inherit each other's traits, but I'm not sure. So, such a stunning flower. It's really, really beautiful, and they're very short-lived. This is going to close up very soon. This plant is uh, hardy from zone 9B to 11, and it's pretty much dormant below 50 degrees, and it needs oh, above 60 degrees to grow. So it will get heavy in time too, I like to add that, and so be careful that it may tip your pot. So these varieties do get quite large in time. So give us a like and a subscribe and have yourself a wonderful day. And consider growing an Epiphyllum hokeri. It's a stunning, stunning flower. And I've never seen a flower open up so quick. Next time I'm gonna time lapse the whole thing. I think it'd be pretty cool. All right, have a great day. Take care.